Hey guys, today's video lecture topic is going to be DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and I'm going to warn you that we're going to cover a lot of ground today. We're going to cover the history of DNA, its structure, and how it replicates. So as always, fill in your notes organizer, make sure that you have every answer complete. So we're going to jump right in with how did we learn about DNA? So in the early 1900s, scientists knew a lot of things. They knew that traits were inherited, meaning they were passed down from one generation to the next. They knew that genetic information was carried in chromosomes, and they knew that chromosomes consisted of really two things, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and protein, but they had no idea which one of those molecules, DNA or protein, was the true carrier of genetic information. So that's what the next slide, couple of slides are about. Is it DNA or is it protein that carries genetic information? So the first scientist to attempt to answer this question was a, was a guy named Frederick Griffith in 1928, and he studied two strains of bacteria, um, the bacteria that causes pneumonia. Now there are two strains of this type of bacteria, a smooth strain which doesn't or which does cause the disease and the rough strain which does not cause the disease. And here is his experiment. He injected the smooth disease causing strain into a mouse and saw that the mice die. And then he injected the rough strain, the non-disease causing strain, and he saw that the mouse lives. Now, he thought, what if I heat kill, what if I burn the S strain and then inject that into the mouse? And he found that the mice lived, so he somehow had an effect on um, the cells in the bacteria. And then he said, what if I heat kill the S strain, the smooth strain, the, the disease-causing strain, and I make it so that it doesn't cause disease, but then I add the non-disease-causing strain to it. And you would, you would think that since the heat killed the disease-causing strain and he adds the non-disease-causing strain to it that the mice would live, but as it turns out, the mouse died. So his conclusion was that living organisms, such as bacteria, can pass genetic information from one to another. And he called this transformation. But the question he did not really answer was what is the molecule that's responsible for doing that? What carries genetic information? So a guy named Oswald Avery comes along in 1944, and he repeats Griffith's work in order to try and determine which molecule was responsible for carrying genetic information. So he, he basically did the same experiment, but he isolated various macromolecules from those heat-killed S cells, and he exposed them separately to the live R cells. So in other words, macromolecule, you should know that word, we learned about that in biochemistry. He took out the lipids, he took out the sugars, the polysaccharides, he took out the proteins, and he took out the nucleic acids, and he added them one by one. And he saw that when he added the lipids, the sugars, and the proteins, the mice lived. But when he added the nucleic acids, the mice died. So he concluded that the mice die when they're exposed to the S strain DNA, or in other words, DNA is the carrier of genetic information. The, it was DNA that was passed from the heat-killed S strain to the non-disease-causing rough strain, and that's why the mice died. Okay, then, you know, scientists are skeptical. They're like, okay, one scientist concludes that it's DNA, but they needed more than that. So scientists named Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase come along, and they say, we're going to prove once and for all that it's DNA and not proteins that get passed along. They were studying viruses. They were studying a very specific type of virus called a bacteriophage. And a bacteriophage is a virus that infects or attacks bacteria. Now, conveniently, bacteriophages are made up of two parts. They have an outer protein coat, and they have inner DNA in the core. Now, the thing about viruses, remember, is that they cannot reproduce on their own. They have to inject their genetic material into a host in order to reproduce. So Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase thought, if we can figure out what it is that they're injecting, because they didn't really understand which parts were what, if we can understand what they're injecting, then we know what is the, the genetic information that gets passed on from the virus to the bacteria that causes the bacteria to make more viruses. Okay, so what do they inject, the protein or the DNA? So how did they discover this? Well, they labeled both parts of the virus with radioactive isotopes. In, in other words, they kind of made them glow, okay? They marked them. Think of that. The radioactive phosphorus that they used attached to the DNA, um, attached to the genetic material inside the core of the virus. The radioactive sulfur attached to the protein. So they said, okay, let's let the bacteriophage viruses infect the bacteria and see what is passed on. And they found radioactive phosphorus in the bacteria, which allowed them to conclude that the virus was passing genetic information, not protein, 
Okay, look at the protein. The protein stayed on the, the outside of the virus and they, you know, went on their merry little virus way. But the core, the DNA, was injected into the bacteria. So since they found radioactive phosphorus, they concluded that DNA is the molecule that is passed on and therefore the carrier of genetic information. It could no longer be denied. So, in other words, nucleic acids, not proteins, DNA and RNA are the carriers of genetic information, which is actually kind of weird because in terms of molecules, like DNA is pretty simple. Proteins are really huge and really complex and, and so numerous that scientists were convinced it had to be proteins, but we know that it's DNA that's the carrier of genetic information. All right, so now that we know that this is the super important molecule, how did we come up with its structure? How did we, how did we conclude what it looks like? There were lots of scientists involved in this as well. So first up was a, was a guy named Erwin Shargoff, and this was about 1950, and he was studying the four nitrogen bases in deoxyribonucleic acid. He didn't really understand like the importance of the nitrogen bases, um, but he didn't know that they were part of deoxyribonucleic acid, and he noticed something really interesting. He noticed that no matter what type of sample he took, no matter what DNA he took from any organism, he noticed that adenine and thymine always occurred pretty much in equal amounts, no matter what organism he was looking at. And then he noticed that guanine and cytosine always sort of occurred in equal amounts, no matter what species he was looking at. So we call this Chargoff's rule, that A is always going to equal T, and that C is always going to equal G. And he, you know, wrote papers on this, that adenine and thymine are always equal, and cytosine and guanine are always equal, but he didn't really understood and understand what that meant in terms of the structure of DNA. We'll get to that in a minute. He did know that there were two categories of nitrogen bases. There were pyrimidines, which were single ring bases, and there were purines, which were double ringed bases. A um, couple of things to remember. I always remember pyrimidine is the smaller base, but the longer word. Purine is the shorter word, but the bigger base. Um, and then I remember which ones are which because pyrimidine has the letter Y in it. And conveniently, the two bases that have the letter Y in them are the pyrimidines, so thymine and cytosine. And then purines are the other two, adenine and guanine. So a pyrimidine always pairs with a purine because A and T pair together and C and G pair together. We know that now, and that was conclusions that Watson and Crick made, but Chargoff didn't really get that. He just, he just understood that A and T were equal and C and G were equal. Okay, then there was another scientist around the same time named Rosalind Franklin, one of my all-time favorite scientists, and she was using a technique called X-ray diffraction, which is essentially taking pictures by bending uh, X radiation, you know, X ray radiation around certain molecules. And she took this really famous picture, photo 51, that looked just like this, that indicated that DNA was a double helix, that it had a, you know, double spiraling shape to it. And that was her real big contribution was that she, you know, took this picture that allowed Watson and Crick to conclude that DNA was a double helix. And that was really sort of like the missing piece in their puzzle to allow them to build the first accurate model of the double helix of DNA. Now, I always say that Watson and Crick sort of put the pieces of the puzzle together. They really didn't do a whole lot of research on their own. They collected research from various scientists. Now, it's questionable whether that was done ethically or not. But they took the conclusions of other scientists and put it all together to say, okay, this is the structure of DNA. And they built the first accurate model, which ended up winning them a Nobel Prize. So what is the structure of DNA then? What did their model look like? Well, it's a double helix, or sometimes known as a twisted ladder. The rails, okay, so for it's like a ladder, that would be the rails or the outside of the double helix, um, are alternating sugars and phosphates. So it goes sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, all the way down the molecule. The rungs, or steps of the ladder, are made up of nitrogen-based pairs. Those are attached to the sugar. Okay, and then by nitrogen-based pairs, I mean an A and a T paired together, an adenine and a thymine paired together, and a C and a G paired together, a cytosine and a guanine paired together. Um, Watson and Crick concluded that hydrogen bonds were responsible for holding those nitrogen-based pairs together, and that those hydrogen bonds can only form between certain bases. A pyrimidine, a small single-ringed base, can only form a hydrogen bond with a purine, a double-ringed base. So you always have a small and a big together a cytosine and a guanine, an adenine and a thymine. And this shows the number of bonds. Adenine and thymine have two, cytosine and guanine have three hydrogen bonds between them. 
Um, back when we learned about macromolecules, you memorized that a nucleic acid was a macromolecule made up of nucleotides, a repeating monomer, the base unit. So now I want you to know what is a nucleotide. You memorized that before. What is a nucleotide? A nucleotide is made up of three parts. Your sugar, which is deoxyribose, that's where that comes from in the name of DNA. A phosphate, so two parts of a backbone, and then a nitrogen base, either A, T, C, or G. So you can see in this picture here, this is an adenine nucleotide. So those three things together make up a subunit. That subunit is repeated over and over and over and over and over, and that's what makes a molecule of DNA. Okay, so now we're going to get into DNA replication. DNA replication, the point is to use DNA in order to make more DNA. Why does a cell need to do that? Okay, this is going back to our cell cycle unit. A cell needs to replicate its DNA so that when it divides, it ensures that the new cells have the correct number of chromosomes. Just to review, where is this taking place? Well, DNA is found in the nucleus, so DNA replication is taking place in the nucleus. When does this take place? We know it takes place in interphase, more specifically the S stage of interphase. Remember, S stands for synthesis. And now let's talk about how does this take place. So here is the big picture. How does DNA replication take place? Each strand of DNA is going to serve as a blueprint or as a template for the new strand so that by the end of replication, you end up with two molecules of DNA, right? You're replicating it, duplicating it, each that have an original parent strand, that's this blue color here, and each that have a new, newly built strand, that's this red color here. So we call this the semi-conservative model of replication. Semi meaning somewhat, conserved meaning, you know, kept together. So half of it is kept together, half of it is the old parent strand, and half of it is the newly built strand. I'm going to give you a simplified version of replication, and it's still sort of complicated even though it's simplified. And then we're going to get into the more complex version of replication in class. So the simplified version is that first DNA needs to unwind and unzip. And that happens with an enzyme called DNA helicase. So helicase unwinds and unzips a molecule of DNA, and that location where it is unzipping is called a replication fork. Okay, it kind of looks like a you know, fork in the road, which way are you going to go? So DNA helicase unwinds and unzips a molecule of DNA, and then another enzyme called DNA polymerase comes along and adds on those new complementary nucleotides in order to build the new strand of DNA. So two big enzymes really important in DNA replication. Helicase, which unwinds and unzips first, and then DNA polymerase, which puts it together, puts together the new strand. Now, in DNA replication, there's a leading strand and a lagging strand, and we'll get into this detail more. But in a leading strand, it starts replication here, and it goes on in one direction. In the lagging strand, it's happening all over the place at once. So it creates these tiny little pieces of replicated DNA, and those are called Okazaki fragments, after the scientists who discovered it, of course. Okay, so if this was a sequence of DNA that was on the exposed parent strand, can you figure out what the complementary strand would be knowing Shargoff's rules? Remember, polymerase is going to add the complementary nucleotides. So what pairs with A? You should know that would be T, thiamine. Okay, so see if you can finish that sequence. Don't cheat. Pause this until you're done and then click play. All right, so our complementary strand, our newly built strand, is going to be T-A-G-G-C-T-T-C-G-A-A. -A. And we'll talk about the 3' prime and 5' prime more in class. And then here is the complicated version of DNA replication. I want you to pause on this picture and fill in the, the diagram that's on your notes organizer. Um, make sure you have every box filled in. Okay, that's it for today. I know we covered a lot of ground, so if you need to, this is the kind of video lecture that now that you have everything filled in, just watch it again. Go take a break and then pause, come back, watch it again. I'm going to post lots and lots of tutorials throughout this unit online. Spend some time on those if you need some extra help. Y'all have a good day.